Hey everyone and welcome to the Grumpy Dads podcast. This week, as usual, we've got Chris. Hello mate, and this week we've got an amazing guest and it is Kira Lawrence. Hey Kira. Hi, <laughs> thank you for having me. As always with the podcast, we start off with icebreaker antics. I have a search on the net and I look for products with one star reviews and I read out the reviews and you've got to guess what the product is based on the review. Okay. There's three reviews per product. If you guess it on the first review, it's three stars. Second review is two stars and last review is one star. Duncan, as always, will be on your team to try and help. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the running joke that he's terrible, but he's okay. uh, he's not at times. So fingers crossed. <laughs> right. okay. Inconsistent is the uh... Inconsistent, yeah. <laughs> okay. So first product, first review. It's so dangerous putting it down. Almost lost a finger. Dangerous putting it down. Almost lost a finger. Okay, I'm thinking maybe something to do with DIY, maybe like a hammer or an axe or something like a drill. Which one do you want to go for? Because I'm only having one guess. It could be a knife. It could be a knife. Because if it, it could if be a it, knife. If you put it down and it almost cuts your finger, it could be a knife. Because I'm thinking like that cuts. So I'm going with a knife. You're definitely going with a knife, yeah. Yeah, I'm going with a knife. No, it's not. Okay, Duncan. <laughs> At the risk of an impending divorce, I'm going to go a couple of copy my wife's made. Oh, you'd lose a finger, and oh, uh, yeah, I guess so if she's if she's that way inclined. <laughs> it's sort of yakuza themes, but it's uh, <laughs> as you can guess. <laughs> it's more likely laced with arsenic, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second review. What they don't tell you is you'll need a cover. The one it comes with is terrible. A duvet. A duvet. No, it's not. Don't oh. go. What duvet do you put down that could cut your feet? That would be a vicious duvet. A duvet made of knives. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing like an Anne Summers catalogue. No, we've, yeah, we've, we've, yeah, we've, got to, we've got to be fair, Kira, to the other guests. You've okay. had your guess. Yours is duvet. Duncan, what's your guess? I want to say a biography by Donald Trump, but I'm not going to. Okay, don't um, say. <laughs> always could do with another cover. Any picture of him is going to be terrible, and it would certainly be cutting. <laughs> um, oh, mate, I, I'm going to say a Stanley knife or something along those lines. A Stanley knife, is that your guess? Well, yeah, I said that, so I'll have to stick yeah. with it now. I'm regretting it instantly because Kira's already said knife, and I've just realised that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a Stanley knife. Last review. Really unsafe and unsecure when it's up. Oh, is it? Is it like a kid's indoor tent? No, I really <laughs> thought your enthusiasm really, it really my made sense. So it could just be a really vicious, you know, um, they pop up, they could take your finger, you could need a cover. It would. No, no. Um, let's. Uh, let, let, uh, I'll, I'll give Kira a guess first. Are you, are you looking around your house for something? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of thinking, like, I'm looking around the kitchen going, what's really dangerous? Like, what could I think that's be really dangerous? <laughs> um, I will say we probably use it every single day. Although, there's another clue. Judging by Duncan's shirt, he probably doesn't. Oh, an ironing board! Yes, well done. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. I, I couldn't think of anything else. Well, it's not there. It oh, doesn't look like Duncan shirt. He looks like a pile of crap, basically. It, yeah. it, it, does, yeah. it doesn't look like it hasn't been iron, mate. I was... Yeah. No, I just think my, my shirts course. have to stretch anyway. Oh, that was a good one. That was fun. That's good. Okay, we're on, uh, we're on one star. So, second product, first review. Literally, the only mildly good thing about this is it sways side to side when it's on without falling over. Is there something that sways side to side without falling over? It's not meant to sway. It sounds like me on a night out, but yeah. I'm sure <laughs> that's not the answer. <laughs> they, they bought you just so they could see you sway side to side. <laughs> I'm going to go with a garden swing. A garden swing. No, it's mm -hmm. not. That's a good guess, though. Okay. Not meant to sway. But it's it meant does, to... but doesn't fall over. I'm going to say a tripod. No, another good guess. 
Review two. Thought I'd made a mistake building it, but there's more draft at the back than the front. Don't say you again. <laughs> <laughs> is it a pedestal fan? Oh, I, I'm going to have to give it you. Um, okay. Yes, it is, it is a fan. The last review on that one was okay. Unstable went on, blades really sharp, and grill unsecure. It was a real cheap one as well. Okay. So. Surely because, not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hear it because uh, Duncan's got that on the second one for you. That means you're on three stars so far, so we need a really good, uh, strong one with this one. Okay. First review. Okay. Very odd smell. It's meant to be lavender, but smells like moldy sweets. Is it me again? Oh, oh, I know, I know, I know. Oh, this is, uh, I'm sensing confidence. You think? You know, <laughs> you know, in, you know, when you were a kid in sweetie packs and they were called Parma Violets and there were those purple sweets and the little, they were the little round things called Parma yes. Violet sweets. And you used to get them in goodie bags at birthday parties when you were a kid yeah. and you'd eat all the rest of the sweets and you'd leave them because they just looked gross. Because they taste like flowers with sugar. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember those, but it's not the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like one of those scented stuffed toys? Oh, yeah, and, and it's not, but that's a good guess again. Second review. The residue this leaves behind, it can almost be used to lay bricks. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't buy it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that'd pass building muster. <laughs> Is it like a cleaning paste type stuff? No, it's not. I'm thinking bath bathroom cleaning products. Ooh. products? Ooh. I, mean, so, I think um, I've got it. I think like something like I don't know, bleach. Say bath bomb. Like, Say bath bomb. Bath bomb, bath bomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, okay, well, uh, we'll let you have the two stars on that. It is a uh, bath bomb. Final review. If you bathe in lava, this would be great. By the time it uh, dissolves, my bath is stone cold. So it's a uh, <laughs> really nasty bath bomb. So you finish on five stars. And that yeah. is somewhere in the middle of the pack because we haven't sorted out the league table yet, which I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Kira. Uh, we, we know you're extremely busy, as we're, we're going to find out uh, with yeah. the questions we've got for you. But, yeah, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It means so much when I can get these kind of opportunities to represent learning disability and me and my career. So thank you very much for letting me on your show. Thank, no, thank we're really you. glad to have you. Absolutely. What can you tell us? Because you, you work for, for MenCap, the charity. What can you tell us about the charity itself? MenCap is the UK's leading learning disability charity. We campaign and aim to fundraise and campaign and raise awareness of learning disability. And we aim to support the lives of people with a learning disability, their families, their friends and their carers. There are 1.5 million people living in the UK right now with a learning disability. And what we want to do is MENCAP are here to try and raise positive awareness so people know what a learning disability is and to basically make sure this world is equal for them and treat them equally and so that they have an equal chance at life. That's fantastic. It is absolutely fantastic. How did you become involved with, uh, with MENCAP? I became involved in MENCAP after I left college and I was trying to find work. I was trying to find a job and I was finding it really, really difficult. And so after a year of real frustration, after real anxiety of not getting anywhere, after going to lots of failed interviews, not getting the right support, I finally got told about the disability officer at my local job centre and she introduced me to MENCAP and I've been in MENCAP now 19 years and very happily working. That's amazing. <laughs> with, with MENCAP, uh, they've obviously started out, uh, they do what they do, but what are the focus and goals of the charity itself? What, what are their aims? Their main aims are to campaign. So we want people with learning disabilities to have equal access to healthcare. 
So we make sure we work with the NHS to make sure they understand learning disability. We also have a housing service called Golden Lane Housing. So if somebody with a learning disability wanted to move out of their parents' home and be independent and have their own home, Golden Lane Housing are there to help them if they want a home of their own with support. We also have a fantastic employment service called Employ Me. So they're fantastic. They do a great job getting people jobs. So we do lots of wonderful things to really try and help make better the lives of people with a learning disability. Okay. <laughs> I have actually turned my phone off. So I don't have any. My phone is off. Yeah, so I, that, I don't remember this happening with Jon Snow, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us about that, because you were on with Jon Snow during the week we saw. Yes, so last week, Channel 4 contacted Mencap about a report that came out from Public Health England about deaths of people with a learning disability through the coronavirus pandemic. So they got in touch with Mencap and they said, we want someone with a learning disability to come on Channel 4 for and talk about this report and what they think about it and I was put forward for it which was such an honour and I got interviewed by Jon Snow the living legend. Earlier I spoke to Kira Lawrence she has a learning disability and works for the charity Mencap as an accessible information officer. For those who are unfamiliar this isn't the character from Game of Thrones he's a respected <laughs> British reporter. <laughs> yes. how did you feel um that were you nervous about going on because yeah. I've, I've watched the interview and you don't look you came across so so well and and so at ease but yeah. I, i'm guessing inside you were you were quite nervous about it all yeah definitely like when they said to me you'll be interviewed by john snow i kind of had this moment of oh my god i've watched him in the past and like he's really tough like oh get me out of this but then actually he was lovely he was so <laughs> nice and um, he chatted to me beforehand he he really put me at ease and made me feel part of like what he was going to be doing and like we talked about a couple of the questions just to kind of warm ourselves up and he he's lovely like he was so nice and he's also now following me on twitter as well so my campaign worked really oh wow yeah that's very cool you mentioned that um mencap worked with the nhs um as uh, say our, our current government have they ever got in, in touch and, and and maybe asked for some sort of consultation from mencap or advice yes we we have a very good relationship with the government um we have a parliamentary team at mencap who look after the parliament work with mencap and with learning disability we also with the nhs that's been an ongoing relationship um, over the years where Mencap have launched campaigns around healthcare. We've had campaigns around deaths of people with a learning disability because of poor care. So we wanted to teach the NHS about why actually if they just communicated with people a bit better, they could actually save their lives. What we're saying to the NHS through our current Treat Me Well campaign is actually if you made reasonable adjustments, which are small changes, you could actually really, you know, stop someone from dying. That's amazing. I mean, that's something that I'm guessing my daughter had an operation earlier in the year due to teeth. She had to go. She won't let being autistic. She won't let anyone near her mouth. Yeah. And so she had to go under a general to have some teeth removed. Yeah. But they phoned us beforehand. They were wanting to establish exactly what what uh, challenges she'd face, what we'd face, what the doctors might face. The only real bummer was they didn't listen to any of it. <laughs> so once we got in, it was like completely. It was almost like we hadn't had the conversation. But right. that I like that they wanted to. I just think the communication down the track sucked. But yeah. I'm guessing that's because of the influence you've had that they're trying to engage and find these things out. Overall, I have had really positive experiences when I've been in hospital. But it's just you have to keep saying, I have rights. I have this right. I have this need. You need to support me in that way. And it's just about reminding people that actually... 
you might need information about your treatment in an easy read way you might need some extra time in an appointment to understand what you're being told you might need to have someone speak to you using really easy words no jargon no big words but just really easy words you might need a letter in easy read that tells you what's happening it might be that you might say right okay today at this appointment we'll do this and then next time we'll do that and kind of break down what's happening so like you do it over time so it's just really small things that can make such a huge difference and actually if we gave them the right training which we are now doing then they can make a change but sadly obviously because of coronavirus a lot of the work that we've been doing has had to stop it will continue at some point yeah. um, hopefully next year and we are still working on it in the kind of behind the scenes but unfortunately we can't go into hospitals at the moment we can't go and do training which we were really hoping to do this year but hopefully next year things will be better and we'll get to go and train staff next year Moving aside from the MenCap side of things, for you personally, what was it like growing up knowing that you had these learning disabilities yourself? And, and how did that affect you and what has happened later in life to really help with that? Because, I mean, clearly you've done so well for yourself. But obviously, you've had the support of MenCap in that. I get a lot of questions on, on my Facebook group from parents who are just worried about what's going to happen with my kid when they turn 18, what, you know, what future holds for these kids with learning disabilities for yourself I mean what was childhood like and, and how did that translate into okay. the transition to adulthood my learning disability didn't actually get picked up properly until I was about nine years old it was when I was in school my difficulties were put down to sheer laziness they were put down to I don't want to learn they were put down to Kira can't learn. They were put down to, oh, she's just being silly. She's just being naughty. And finally, at the age of nine, things came to a head. And I was finding school life so difficult. And I remember being in a class one day and literally out of sheer frustration... I just started ripping this book apart, just going, I'm not getting this. And literally I was pulling pages at my, like, I think it was like a maths book or something. And I remember just dropping it on the floor and literally walking out of the classroom. And that for me, I had never done that before. And I was like, I didn't even understand what was going on. And I got so upset. I was getting angry and so finally, the school went, right, okay, there is a problem. And they brought in this educational psychologist lady. And she said, Kira's not naughty. Kira's got a learning disability. But the way you're teaching her is not the right way for her. You're giving her information in a very quick amount of time. You're not giving it to her in the way she understands. No wonder she's getting frustrated. And so finally, the local authority agreed to run a special educational needs statement. So for all those years of my school just ignoring me and telling me what I was, we actually had a proper name for it. Once I was diagnosed and once I had my SEN statement in place, it was then decided by my family, by all these professionals who assessed me, that I would no longer be able to survive in mainstream education ever, ever again, because mainstream school life just wouldn't be for me. And so then I went to a special needs school. It was a very small school, a very secluded school, and that's what I needed at the time. And I left there with five GCSEs. We said, Chris and I, Chris particularly, has, has um, made points on this, that there needs to be more education within the education system on you know, what disability is and, and how that relates to the students in schools, because we've got a system that just caters for one style of learning, sadly. 
Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. And I know MENCAP does really good work around that. We do a lot of lobbying around SEN. Some of my colleagues work on education and I know they're really trying to get schools to understand and they're trying to make sure schools have the right training and resources. I think things are slowly changing, mm. but I think things are still need to be a bit better. It's heartbreaking though, isn't it? Take your case, nine years old. And we're not, we're not talking about a child that can't learn. Yeah. And that being the end of it, that's the only yeah. issue. We're talking about a child that will end up with anxiety, wondering why they aren't taking it in. Uh, in some cases, um, depression, yeah. anger, all of these things building up in a child because the school's unable to identify at the time yeah. that if they've done it a different way, it's basically trying to fit a square peg in a circle hole, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and once you do give, once you get that right, and you're testament to that, once you get that right, yeah, you walk away with five GCSEs. Kira, I um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions because Mencap isn't sort of your only feather in your cap. You're an ambassador for a couple of uh, is it charities or is it uh, companies? Yeah, charities. Because you've got the Eve Appeal, haven't you? And Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust. Yeah, yeah. what can you tell us about the both of those? About a year and a half ago, I decided that I wanted to go and have my very first smear test, cervical smear test. During my career at Mencap, I'd heard stories where people with learning disabilities had been stopped from going to those kind of appointments because they weren't able to have capacity to understand what that meant so I was like actually why don't I go I need to go anyway so I booked my own smear test I went along I talked to the nurse about what I was doing and why I wanted to have it done and I said can I use this to kind of raise awareness and she was like yeah great so I made a video about my experience and off the back of it, it had like 11,000 views on my Twitter channel. So you're, what you're saying is for our channel, Chris and I should probably go for a smear test. Yes. So men can go and get checked. Men can have appointments like men can go and get checked for their bits as well. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so then off the back of my video and all the feedback I'd had from my video, Joe's Trust approached me and said, we would love to meet with you. So I met with them for coffee and had a bit of a chat. And then they said, we would love you to be an ambassador. And you're the first person with a learning disability to be an ambassador for us. That's amazing. Like to go and be an ambassador for people with a learning disability to make sure they get smear tests and cervical cancer checks. That's amazing. And then off the back of that, then the Eve Appeal heard of me and also asked me to be an ambassador. And again, I'm the first person with a learning disability to be an ambassador for them. You're an actual inspiration. It is. Um, but we, you aren't finished there, are you? Because no. you're also a trustee for Sunnybank Trust and Head yeah. to Head Sensory Theatre. Yeah. Um, tell us about those as well. So they are more disability organisations, which I'm very proud to be linked with. I'm a trustee for them, so that means I have to go to meetings. I basically, as a trustee, hold the chief exec to account for the work that the charity does. So it's a really, really important role. And what I wanted to do was say, if I'm going to have this role... I don't want it just to tick the box to say you have a person with a learning disability being a trustee. I'm going to do this properly. And I've proved to them that with adjustments, with support, I can do a really good job. I'm also Fantastic. a patron of Dance Syndrome as well. Yeah, I, I thought there was only 24 hours in the day, but apparently it's <laughs> got a sort of time machine or... Uh, it's it's something that I've promoted, but could you could you let us know um, just a little bit about Dance Syndrome for our viewers as well, because it is a fantastic thing that they're doing. So all their dancers are people who have a disability, 
and they at the moment are running virtual workshops dance workshops for people to do dance which are fantastic fun i've done some of them they also go out and they perform at big events at conferences at meetings at workshops at everywhere and they basically go out and all you see is these talented people dancing in front of you and they also run workshops as well with dance coaches and the dance coaches have a disability some all, some also have haven't got a learning disability so it's really inclusive so they work side by side with people with disabilities and without and it's a fantastic organization earlier this year in lockdown the first lockdown they asked me to be a patron I was like, I would love to work with them. Like, I'd love to be part of them. And they asked me to be a patron, which was, I was so honoured. I'm actually trying to get them quite an exciting opportunity, but I can't see any more than that at the moment. Right, OK. Oh, and tease. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it looks like all involved, everybody has such a great time. It looks like such a, a fun thing. Yeah. And everybody looks like they're having a terrific time as well. Is there anything that you're currently working on or your uh, any products that you're hoping to work on in the future? I'm actually in a secondment job at the moment for MenCap. So at the moment, I haven't been able to do my normal job for MenCap, which is sitting in the campaigns team. So at the moment, I'm doing another job for MenCap temporarily, which is helping to make easy read versions of the rules of the coronavirus guidance that's been my baby for the last seven months now is that like a never-ending task because they seem to change the rules quite a lot Um, i've had to go back on them like two or three times now and it's like damn it (laughs) my mission is if one person with a learning disability can understand what i've written then I know it suits people with a learning disability out there. I, I can completely understand your frustration. Yeah. I mean, finishing yeah. something that, that big uh, and then 45 minutes later, you've got to do it again because they've changed the rules. Uh, <laughs> In Australia, they call it painting the Harbour Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you finish, you've got to restart it again. Um, <laughs> when I first started the role, I decided the first thing I was going to do is create a group made up of people with learning disabilities to help me in my work. People with a learning disability are the experts of their lives and they give really honest feedback about my work. I love working with that group now and they've helped make all the rules easy read. It's on our website. I'm very proud of it. There are so many things I would love to do. I would love to go on Strictly Come Dancing and prove what we can do. I'd love to do that. I'd love to go on more TV shows and talk about having a learning disability and why that's important. I've got, I've got like a huge dream bucket list that needs ticking off now. I can't, I can't help but think of the the things that I want to put you in. Oh, the top of my head, I'm I'm thinking I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. How do you feel about dancing on ice as well? Because um, yeah, we, we can campaign for something like that. That'd be amazing. I haven't been ice skating probably since the age of 16. I remember going with some college friends to a local rink. I don't think I've actually skated since since I was like 16, 17. No, me neither, actually. What about you, Duncan, being from Australia? (laughs) The funny thing is there was actually an ice rink near me. I used to do my school sport because it was just a bludge. and I spent more time playing, I think it was an F1 video game they had there. <laughs> we, uh, we switched it on and off at the yes. wall and gave you a free game. So we, we seem to play a lot of that. <laughs> I'm a celebrity. Now, I don't like snakes. I, I have a fear of crocodiles. And yet you work with politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with politicians. I'm, I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm all right with them. Anything that moves, anything that's a bit... Oh, no. I think you might be all right in Wales, though. I don't think there's too many snakes. Or... Yeah. I don't know. Did I, you I haven't watched much of it. No, I haven't, watched much of... I haven't watched any of it. My wife has, but I just... Oh, my like gosh, this poor guy. He's, like, terrified of everything. and they... He's been shut in a coffin thing in the oh, ground yeah. with, yeah. like, 50 snakes all crawling over him. 27 right. Let's get them out! Get them out!
Oh, well oh, done, boys. Get me oh. out, get me out. Take it easy, Jordan. Nice and right. slow. Nice and slow. Get well, me out, get me out. Just take it slow. Just take it slow, take it slow. And it was it was hilarious to watch because it was the whole time he's like, go to my happy place, go to my happy place, and he's trying to shout instructions out, go to my happy place, go to my happy place. <laughs> he was absolutely bricking it, the poor I guy. Saw, I saw the eating challenge one last night and I was like, oh my god, like I don't know how they're doing this. Like I wouldn't do it. Nuts roast. <laughs> oh, oh, it's not even warm. Oh. He's chosen his oh. dance to go. All right, ready? Yeah. yeah. Three, two, one. Yeah. Good man. Oh, God, what's that? that's just come out of it. Oh, oh, yeah. keep it in. <laughs> I'm a celebrity, no way. Strictly, yes. Dancing on ice, yes. I'm a celebrity, no. <laughs> <laughs> what about Big Brother? Oh, now, actually, me and my best friend did apply to go on it. My best friend got through, I didn't. It's a bit weird because obviously I've got a famous cousin and obviously like, you know, when they go in there and they're like, oh, have you ever met anyone famous? Who do you know? And like they have those conversations <laughs> that for me would probably be quite uncomfortable. Like, yeah. I, I don't know whether I would want people knowing me and my business and like who my family are. So yeah. I'm, I'm quite glad I didn't go on Big Brother in the end. Draw. Scratch the next question. Scratch the next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the uh, the draw is with Big Brother because obviously a lot of people watch the show and they think, oh, it's really entertaining. They're having parties and doing all this. But what they forget is they're living 24 hours yeah. in four walls with all these people. Yeah. I get mad. It must be like torture. I would go bonkers. I would, I would literally be like, let me out of here. I'm off. Like, I know. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would hate Big Brother. Like, I love it. I love Big Brother. I, I used to watch every series of Big Brother faithfully. I was a huge fan of the show. When I didn't get through, like, I went to an audition with my best friend. My best friend got through the audition. I didn't, thank God. But <sighs> he nearly got through to it. But then they said to her, do you know anyone famous? And obviously, because she knows me and my cousin and she was like I'd have to lie and say no I don't know anyone even though I know your cousin and but like she was really worried that like she would end up saying something about like oh yeah her best friend has a famous cousin and that's who he is and it's so, like I'm actually quite glad she didn't get on it in the end. Uh, this leads us up to uh, a final question um, mm -hmm. Kira. After everything you've done and somehow fitting all of this within the time you've got 24 hours in a day, how do you relax and unwind? Or is that just the straw that broke the camel's back? When I do have downtime, I like spending it with my husband. We've been married now seven years, but we've been together 23 years. So that's a big achievement. I like spending time with my family. I've got two beautiful nephews and a niece who I who are like my children. I love spending time with them out of, when I have time out. I love going to the theatre. Obviously, we can't do that at the moment. I love singing. I love dancing. I love. Oh, going there's X Factor one we can add to the list now as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. X Factor, Stars in Their Eyes, Pop Idol. Yeah, pop stars. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever comes up next, yeah. I actually did apply for The Voice, but didn't get through the audition, which was really weird. But of all the game shows and everything, if you could go on one, which one would it be? Because mine would be Crystal Maze. When I was younger, I was obsessed with Gladiators when I was little. I was obsessed oh. by it. I'm not very fit, like I'm not fit. I am not, I'm not a gymnast. I'm not fit at all. But I would have loved to have done gladiators. I actually met the guy who is the gladiator wolf. And I was like, you're not really wolf. scary, are you? And he was like, no, it's a panto baddie. And I was like, no, you're not hard. And I met Diane Newdale, who is Jet. Because at the time, I was a volunteer steward at my local theatre. So I met her because she was in the Panto that year at our local theatre. She was lovely. She was so nice. And so, like, I was a huge Gladiator fan. She bought me, like, this little, like, Gladiators poster and, like, she signed it for me. I and loved Jet, her. Jet was my favourite as well, for, for other reasons. But... Um... <laughs> I mean, Supermarket Sweep is back on Oh, that's another good one. Um, uh, and we're also talking the kiddies ones as well, because you had 
fun house yeah. finders keepers where you yeah. had to trash the room yeah. i don't know why that appealed to me so much i love the fact that i could smash a room to pieces and not have to tidy it up um what about you duncan i actually quite like tipping point um but i think if mm. i you know the one that i always loved i'd be useless at it in every way was scrap heap challenge i used to love oh, that yeah oh you know what would be really cool is that lego one they do lego one there's like a Lego challenge and it's, you've got teams of two that go through and you've got to sort of make things of Lego each week. And oh, that sounds good. It's really cool. There's I a lot think of- I'd like to be a close observer of Scrappy Challenge rather than taking part in it. Uh, also, <laughs> Krypton Factor, which was a great one. I also think, wouldn't it be great if we actually saw more people with a learning disability on TV shows? What's your opinion of the Emmerdale storyline at the moment? My view is, is I will be watching them. I, like I, I will be very honest once I see the first episode. I will be very honest about my opinion. For now, because I haven't seen anything about it yet, I haven't seen any episodes yet, I want to wait and see what the first episode is like. Apparently there's going to be a few leading up towards Christmas. I do feel like TV shows have a right to show real life issues like these kind of things. Me and Mencap are going to be watching um, and we hopefully will work with Emma Dale possibly. But at the moment, we're just going to wait and see what happens with the story and make sure they do it properly because what we want to do is make sure we actually talk about it from a positive point of view. That's, uh, that's if it does get aired, because the backlash that this uh, this storyline has brought on has been unreal. Uh, rightly so. Uh, an MP yesterday, um, I can't remember his name, Stephen something, he wrote to the ITV producers of, of Emmerdale as well, basically voicing his concern over this. They've got a responsibility to make sure that it's done in the right way. They've said they've researched it all, but the issue is, is that... <sighs> From from what I can see, they've they've asked I think a charity. The issue is they haven't asked parents. I think it's it's a it's a very very dangerous game they're playing to to broach this this subject and to go out and write a full storyline surrounding it without actually having all their cards on the table first. There's always I, a danger with these things as well because in the end, TV is sensationalised in one way or another. Yeah, and I mean, I I find soaps so dire at the best of times. I'm not, I I think they're responsible for so much depression because every time I finish an episode of EastEnders, I just want to, I don't know, do something to escape from the misery that I've experienced. <laughs> <laughs> and all these shows, I, I was talking to the wife the other day. She was she was saying, "Did you ever watch Coronation Street?" And I said, I was, I'd always get three bars into the thin tune and I knew I'd hate it because the shit is so depressing. I can't <laughs> it. When I've seen the first few episodes, I can then say, actually, we want to show the positive side of it. That they're just children, like any other children. Yeah. Yes, their families might need a bit more support in their lives to bring their children up. I just really hope Emma Dale... Do it really sensitively, do it really positively. Um, but at the moment, I'm waiting to see the first few episodes before I really need want to make a opinion and comment on it. So, yeah. That's it for this week, everyone. Thank you so much to Chris for joining us. Yeah, thanks very much, mate. And a huge thanks to Kira. Thank you so much for coming on today. You're an inspiration, Kira. It's just been fantastic, especially hearing your story and how you developed into these roles absolute magic and thank you so much thank you for having me you're very welcome <laughs> please do like this episode please do put it in the comments we want to hear your opinion of the emmerdale storyline that's coming up chuck it in the comments we'd love to hear about it please do subscribe every person that subscribes just means that this gets out there a bit more and we can do that a bit more to raise the awareness of learning disabilities and the, the needs of these kids and adults. That's it for this week. We'll see you again next week. Stay safe and we'll see you.